Hello, everyone, and welcome to Policing and the Brain. We are going to start in a minute. We're just waiting for Zoom to load everybody. Hello everyone, I am Carmel Shachar, the Executive Director of the Petrie Sloan Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology and Bioethics at Harvard Law School. I am delighted to welcome you to our event, Policing and the Brain, How Neuroscience Can Contribute to Police Reform. This event is part of the project on law and applied neuroscience, which is a collaboration between us and the Center for Law, Brain, and Behavior at Massachusetts General Hospital. It is also the first event organized by our fourth senior fellow on this project, who I will introduce in a moment. Before I introduce her, a few housekeeping remarks, really the virtual equivalent of where are the bathrooms. There will be a Q&A at the end of this event after the speakers have presented and we welcome your questions. The best way to submit questions is to use the Q&A feature built into Zoom. If you move your cursor down towards the bottom of the Zoom box, you should see a button labeled Q&A and you can click on it and submit questions at any point during the event. You're also welcome to join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag law and neuro. Again, that's hashtag law and neuro. If you submit a question that way, Petrie Flan staff will be monitoring it. We'll pull that question and we'll put it into the Zoom Q&A. Ways that you cannot participate in the conversation. The raise your hand feature results in a really cute little blue hand, but we will not be monitoring or responding to the raise your hand feature, as well as please don't try to use the Zoom chat. So Zoom Q&A or Twitter are the best ways to go about it. With that, I want to introduce Alyssa Spitzer, who is our senior fellow in law and applied neuroscience at the Center for Law, Brain and Behavior and the Petrie Flan Center, as well as an HLS alumna. We are thrilled to have her and we anticipate that this event is going to be one of many very interesting events that she will put on for our communities. Alyssa, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Carmel, and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to thank the Petrie Flom staff, particularly Laura Chong and Emily Remit of the Center for Law, Brain and Behavior for their contributions to this event. And I'd like to say a few words about the Center for Law, Brain and Behavior. CLBB is based at Massachusetts General Hospital and is a unique partnership involving MGH, Harvard Medical School and Harvard Law School and faculty experts across many Boston area schools. We promote and enable the sound application of accurate neuroscience to critical areas of the legal process. CLBB's primary focus is to equip those working in the legal system with the frameworks and tools needed to make better legal decisions and provide better legal services in order to ensure justice and fairness for everyone affected by law. Today, our speakers will address a context where too often there isn't justice or fairness policing, and the persistent problem of excessive force. As we will hear more about shortly, the language of medical science has been used by law enforcement to justify police brutality. But despite this problematic and biased use of medical science, maybe neuroscience holds promise for shaping evidence-based reforms. Our panelists today will speak to different aspects of the question of whether and how neuroscience can contribute to police reform. We have three incredible speakers with us today. We are joined by CLBB Advisory Board member, Judge Andre Davis. Judge Davis served in the United States District Court for the District of Maryland, and then in the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. 
He retired from the federal bench in 2017 in order to serve as the city solicitor for the city of Baltimore. We're also joined by Dr. Altaf Sadi, a neurologist at Massachusetts General Hospital and an instructor of neurology at Harvard Medical School. She is committed to action-oriented, community-engaged, and policy-relevant research that will improve the health outcomes for marginalized populations. And finally, we're joined by CLBB's Chief Science Officer, Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett. Dr. Barrett is a university distinguished professor at Northeastern University with appointments at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. She's the author most recently of Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain. So we will hear from each of our panelists independently and then open to questions and dialogue. So Judge Davis, um, I will turn this over to you. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure and honor to be a member of this panel. I appreciate the opportunity that the center uh, gives me to offer a few observations relevant to the matters under discussion. Um, as a former prosecutor and after 30 years as a state and federal judge at both the trial and appellate levels, I have had a first row seat uh, in my observations of police departments and institutions and law enforcement institutions all over uh, the country and have seen uh, firsthand just how oppressive and how incredibly insular such institutions uh, have been and continue to be. Uh, historically, uh, police departments and law enforcement agencies more generally were constructed uh, after and during Jim Crow to carry out much of the racialized discrimination that unfortunately our country's been known for. Uh, sheriffs, prosecutors, and sometimes ch police chiefs were elected officials, particularly in the South, and their uh, jobs were related, but carried out independent, and they were jealous uh, and resistant to interference by civilian authorities, as well as other law enforcement authorities. It may be of interest to know that while everyone is familiar with the Supreme Court of the United States, we all recognize the Supreme Court of the United States as the ultimate appellate court in our country. But in fact, the Supreme Court once actually conducted a trial, only one in its history, where the court itself, the nine justices, actually conducted the trial. And that trial was of a sheriff from Chattanooga, Tennessee, who had violated an order of the Supreme Court by permitting a black person, a black man charged with a crime to be lynched by the mob gathered outside his jail. Uh, that's just one of many similar stories that one could share. My, my point here is to sort of give us an overview of what uh, racialized policing uh, has been historically. Uh, the current moment certainly is a moment uh, of inflection. And I remain hopeful that progress will continue to be made. Uh, but but uh, racialized policing is not a new, a new phenomenon. It's been with us for the history of policing. And again, the emphasis here is on the insular nature of policing. The insular nature, nature of policing carries over into all areas of forensic science. Everything from fingerprints to so-called bite mark expertise to gunshot residue expertise, the so-called forensic sciences on which so much of criminal prosecution has relied for well over a hundred years in this country has been rooted not on the rigors of genuine science and the scientific method, but on the self-selected, self-trained experts within law enforcement agencies 
who have resisted until the last couple of decades any outside oversight and evaluation of the science. Fortunately, that has changed. A big motivator for the change, of course, was the incredible revolution in DNA science and the use that genetics uh, found to exonerate and to convict those alleged to be involved in criminal activity. One of the things that happened in the late 80s and throughout the 90s and continuing is that legitimate scientists um, found favor in the invitations that they were receiving when the DNA evidence revolution was taking place. Here was an objective, uh, rigorous scientific methodology that, as I say, legitimate scientists felt comfortable coming into the courtroom to participate in the justice system. Uh, up until then, there was concern, legitimate concern, understandable concern on the part of many highly regarded expert scientists that once they became involved in the justice system, whether the civil justice system or the criminal justice system, uh, the stories they'd heard about unfair cross-examination and delays and junk science, legitimate scientists wanted no part of that. And DNA evidence gave rise to an understanding that there was a way for the criminal justice system in particular to impose rigor and true scientific methodology in the forensic scientists. And the American Association for the Advancement of Science and many other highly regarded organizations, including the American Psychiatric Association, the American uh, Psych Psychological Association and others, joined the fight for reform of the criminal justice system. Fast forward to today, and we see those developments taking place now on the ground in the area of neuroscience and law. And we see those developments taking place on the ground at the law enforcement agency level. Um, many people were quite surprised and understandably so. When I left the federal court, my lifetime appointment, doing work that I loved very much to become the city solicitor here in Baltimore City. And the motivation for my doing that after three decades of criticizing police departments, particularly my own police department here in Baltimore, my motivation was to go hands-on in an effort to reform the police department. And we've had some success and we've had some success rooted in brain science. Uh, until very recently, the training that law enforcement officers received in dealing with behavioral uh, crises among the citizens, dealing with persons suffering uh, severe reactions to uh, substance abuse disease and other kinds of interactions that don't call for a violent uh, intervention has been improving tremendously. Now in Baltimore, we had the benefit, and it truly was a benefit, of the federal government coming in and mandating, albeit at the invitation of leading governmental officials, mandating reforms. And those reforms have begun to take hold here in Baltimore and in Maryland more generally in very meaningful ways. You know, the, the slogan, defund the police, is exactly that. It's a slogan. And as President Obama has observed, it can be a slogan that perhaps distracts from the real work needed in police reform. But we are making great success here in Baltimore. What's needed for true police reform and the use of advances in neurobiology to make those reforms a reality? One is leadership. And we're fortunate to have elected leaders, leaders here in Baltimore now. Uh, we are fortunate to have an outstanding 
police commissioner who is totally committed to 21st century policing, the reduction of violent interactions between citizens and uh, members of the police department. And we're fortunate to have leadership at the state level. Uh, there's been a turnover indeed in the last couple of years here in Maryland in the top leadership of the legislature. And that leadership has led the way in bringing reforms to criminal justice generally, and in particular with regard to juvenile justice. Just this week, our state legislature has amended Maryland law to outlaw any possibility of life without parole for those who commit their offenses under the age of 18. It's a remarkable welcome development in the law. And our legislature has obviously studied the evolving science in neurobiology and neurology and has taken seriously what the scientists are telling us about emerging adults and what society can do to optimize outcomes for those who find themselves caught up in the criminal justice system. Another remarkable development here in Maryland, again, happening as we speak, is the possibility now for any person who was sentenced for offenses committed under age 18 will now have the opportunity after 20 years, if he or she or they are still incarcerated, to come back before the court to present evidence of rehabilitation and redemptive potential. So it's just remarkable that both policymakers at the state level and under mandates provided to local law enforcement officers, change is happening far too slowly in my judgment, um, but incremental change is change nonetheless. And so we can be hopeful that continued advances in uh, understanding emerging adults and what the brain is capable of, not capable of, and what uh, we should hold out hope for young people who find themselves in the criminal justice system. Police departments can become a partner and have begun to be a partner in that work that is so critical to optimizing outcomes for individuals who otherwise have had missteps along the way. I, I, I very much look forward to my panelists' observations uh, and thank you for allowing me to participate. It's an honor to have you participating, so thank you. Um, Dr. Saadi. Thanks so much. Um, I, in true academic form, I'm going to be using a PowerPoint presentation. Um, so I'm really honored to be part of this conversation. And I have to say, when I accepted the invitation, I didn't realize that it would fall on the same week as the trial of Derek Chauvin. Um, so this topic feels especially urgent. And what a reminder to us that conversations like this are so critical and really have uh, life and death consequences. And I know that typically people say thank yous to the end, um, but I wanted to give a shout out to two wonderful neurology fellows at MGH, um, Dr. O'Hare and uh, Bodu, who I've written with about the diagnosis of excited delirium, um, which I'm going to focus my portion of uh, today's discussion. Next slide. So excited delirium is a questionable diagnosis that sits at the intersection of psychiatry and neurology and has been used not only in the defense of George Floyd's death, but also hundreds of deaths before him. And so in the context of George Floyd, it was one of uh, Chauvin's fellow officers who said, I am concerned about excited delirium. And I hope um, sort of during my uh, portion of the panel today to show you how it's a contested um, diagnosis that's been used to justify the deaths of people in police custody. And I was very mindful of putting these pictures of George Floyd um, as the loving father that he was, um, because I don't think that he uh, should be reduced to the last nine minutes of his life, nor should anyone um, when we talk about them in the context of um, law uh, enforcement and um, uh, police violence. Next slide. 
So this is a diagnosis that's essentially a wastebasket diagnosis that covers a whole uh, host of different uh, symptoms. Um, so you have them on the slide there, including agitation, confusion, hallucination, elevated the temperature, superhuman strength, immunity to pain, and many others. Um, and now if you can um, click through, um, so these symptoms can stem from underlying um, conditions as varied and disconnected as uh, use of cocaine. Um, and if you could just click, I'm gonna show, um, yeah, uh, the use of cocaine, use of methamphetamines, use of LSD, use of marijuana, uh, infections, obesity, um, bipolar disorder, schizoaffective disorder, a whole host of mental illnesses, um, even autism. Um, and, you know, someone could be, um, uh, uh, you know, being agitated. So somehow um, we are sort of pushed to believe um, that all these different diagnoses um, um, down the line manifest as this diagnosis. And you can really see what a convenient diagnosis it is, right? That a law enforcement expert can use it to describe virtually anyone with a wide variety of underlying conditions, exhibiting a wide variety of symptoms um, to justify the use of super aggressive tactics uh, because superhuman strength is a feature. And then use this diagnosis that hides behind medical terminology to shift the blame from the person exerting the force to the person that dies. Next slide. And I wanna highlight the weak history uh, behind this diagnosis as well. Um, so proponents talk about how well a form of this diagnosis has been talked about in the medical literature uh, for years. Um, but when you really dig deep into that, um, so you, you know, one of the, the um, things that proponents say is, well, you know, Luther Bell in the 1850s described a Bell's mania. And, you know, some of the features overlap with what we talked about. So. Um, there's hyperactivity, there's a sudden onset of symptoms, hallucinations, confusion, elevated temperature, and often resulting in fatality. But if you go back to that, um, his series of patients that he described, actually um, um, those folks had those symptoms over a course of three to six weeks. So really not similar to the diagnosis um, that's used now by law enforcement um, that can cause death abruptly and randomly. Um, and then in the 1980s, the, this term came up again, and this was used at the height of the crack and cocaine epidemic. And the picture on the right is uh, Charles Wetley, who's a forensic pathologist who raised this term again in the medical literature. And the series that he um, put forth initially was using this diagnosis to explain why a series of um, uh, black prostitutes found with cocaine or other drugs in their system had died suddenly. And he purported that the act of having sex caused so, such a dopamine surge um, enough in the context of cocaine in their bodies to cause death. Um, and he said this can happen in excited delirium. Um, but Wetley was wrong and postmortem um, attributions turned out um, to have actually covered up the deaths of those women um, that were later found to have been strangulated and asphyxiated by a serial killer. So really the context of sort of how this diagnosis came around um, is really weak and yet despite its history, its use has grown and now applies to anyone who dies while being subdued by police. And it's really been advanced by people with a vested interest in pushing this diagnosis like uh, Corp uh, Taser Corporation, for example. Next slide. So the American uh, College of Emergency the physicians, or ASAP, is one of the rare medical entities that recognizes this diagnosis, which is not even recognized in the DSM-5. So for those of you who are familiar um, with medicine, that's sort of the chief, you know, psychiatric reference book. Um, and there is a diagnosis of delirium um, that is recognized, but that does not align with excited delirium and doesn't cause sudden death. And I highlight this paper for several reasons, because one, I think it's really unusual that a specialty would create a white paper of, about a diagnosis that's not even in their field. And two, that the white paper included several individuals who are consultants of law enforcement agencies or um, were being paid by T Taser International that has been a big proponent of this diagnosis to justify the use of tasers. tasers. So there's incredible amount of conflict of interest. And the third reason I wanted to highlight, um, highlight this is really how problematic some of their diagnostic criteria, however loose are. Um, so if you can just click once, um, this part of, um, they sort of reference how the struggle with law enforcement is a primary feature. So in this table, right, you'll see sort of um, 
not responding to verbal commands, um, resisting to physical restraint, or even continued struggle despite restraint are common features. Um, and to me, that's as a you know clinician is really hard to hear. I've been in situations in the hospital where restraints have been used. And it's pretty natural for people to resist physical restraints. Typically, we'll use, you know, if we need physical um, wrist restraints. Um, and to, for me to see this and to see how something that could be a natural reaction in a situation where someone is feeling scared or, um, you know, fearing the loss of their life, um, and this, uh, that this is being pathologized somehow and weaponized um, against them. Um, and um, if you click to the next slide, I think it's important um, to think about this in the context of um, a larger racist history of medicine. So this, um, when I was reading about this and seeing sort of that criteria on the ASAP paper, I thought about drapetomania, which um, if you guys are not familiar with, is a diagnosis that was made up in 1851 by Samuel Cartwright, who said that enslaved Africans fleeing slavery had a mental illness. So again, it's sort of the, there's this long-standing history where um, uh, normal um, human behavior might be pathologized um, against a certain group of people and used to justify um, aggressive um, um, tactics. Uh, next slide. And I wanted to talk about sort of other racial tropes that are used um, that are very much intrinsic to the excited delirium um, context. And the two I want to highlight are um, sort of immunity to pain and superhuman strength. And both of these physical characteristics have a long history of being attributed to people of color and specifically black people without supporting evidence. Um, so if you can click um, uh, twice. Yep. Um, uh, so the superhuman um, strength and the superhumanization of black people goes back to slavery. So where people perceive this heightened threat threat um, and use that to justify physical violence against them. And we've seen this come up and again and again in other high profile deaths. So this is um, a quote from Officer, Officer Wilson about Michael Brown, where he says, the only way I can describe it is that I felt like a five-year-old holding on to Hulk Hogan. That's just how big he felt and how small I felt from grasping his arm. And he later describes this intense aggressive face as looking like a demon. Um, and um, I think to, for context, I want to note that Officer Wilson is six foot four and 210 pounds, and Brown um, was an inch taller than him and weighed about 290 pounds, so an 80 pound difference. And yet this is the language that's used um, to say that somehow this person has superhuman strength. And we saw that also in the context of Trayvon Martin, um, where people um, describe the 17 year old as being a boy, um, but in a man's body. Um, and again, it's sort of these racist tropes um, that are used again and again um, and sort of um, used in this medical context as well. Next slide. Um, and the history of black people specifically being immune to pain is something that also has deep roots in medicine. And I'm careful to choose my words because I don't want to say that these are past roots because these persist to this day. So this work was published in the past five years and this included surveying a sample of medical students and residents who I should note would now be full-fledged doctors. And they found that um, half held false beliefs about biological differences between black and white people. So things like black people having thicker skin or less sensitive nerve endings than white people. So these disturbing beliefs are not a thing of the past and diagnoses like excited delirium really play up on these racist notions that remain pervasive today. Um, next slide. Um, next, I wanted to highlight at least one study that was released re recently that puts to question what the actual cause of death is. So um, one of the things about excited delirium is somehow we're required to ignore the fact that these people were restrained or incapacitated by devices like taser. And we're somehow made to believe that this is uh, this diagnosis uh, or the reason they died was because of this diagnosis rather than the restraints. So this study examined 168 documented cases of excited delirium. Um, and if you can click once, um, essentially they found um, that there is no evidence to support excited delirium as a cause of death in the absence of restraint. Um, so I'm going to read that again. So there was no evidence to support excited delirium as a cause of death in the absence of restraint. Um, so nothing here in the data that doesn't say they died um, from the restraint. So next slide. 
Um, so uh, to conclude, excited delirium lacks diagnostic criteria. It can't be assessed at the moment uh, of force is used. It relies on racist stereotypes. It's applied after the fact. And the common factor is that the person has died at the hands of law enforcement who are using super aggressive tactics. And I wanna highlight that there are hundreds of deaths beyond um, George Floyd um, so, and Nathaniel uh, Jones, Randy Escobedo and Kevin Campbell, among many others. Um, in Randy Escobedo's case, um, um, the coroner ruled that the cause of death was excited delirium, and yet the autopsy had shown that there were broken bones, eight broken ribs, internal bleeding. Um, so they're um, really uh, one of um, many examples um, where bad science has been uh, used um, against uh, people to miscarry justice. Um, so I think that's it, and I'm really looking forward to the Q&A and the rest of the conversation with everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Saadi. Um, Dr. Barrett? Um, I, uh, I want to thank you, Alyssa, and CLBB and the Petrie Flom Center for the opportunity to talk to you today. And it, it's a real honor to be on this panel with Judge Davis and Dr. Saadi. And um, I'm going to, uh, what I'm going to attempt to do right now is actually take the historical context that Judge Davis gave us and uh, and gave and use the um, uh, terribly effective example <laughs> that Dr. Saadi gave us um, um, and put that into context of um, what um, neuroscience actually might be able to offer um, in way of a solution, by way of a solution um, to the situation that we're in of racialized policing. And what I want to say here is I'm not going to talk about race at all. And I'm not going to talk about race because I think it's not because I, I think it's not important. I think it's terribly important, but I think we can't really think about how racial bias manifests itself in, in human action and until we understand really how human nervous systems work. And I'm certainly not going to be able to give you, you know, all the details that we know. Um, in, in 10 minutes, but I'm going to attempt to just talk about one or two. And so because this is a really important point, I just want to make the point again. The fact that I'm going to focus on something other than race doesn't mean that I think that race is unimportant. I think it's terribly important what's going on. I just think that we need to bring a lens, the lens that we need to bring, particularly if we want to try to solve this problem, we have to really understand just some basic aspects of um, uh, of um, brain function. And so um, I'm going to use slides like Dr. Saadi. I, uh, I uh, can't really give you a talk without them. Oh, I can't anyways. Um, uh, so um, I'm going to attempt to do that now. Um, and I'm actually going to start with a story. Um, a few years ago, I received an email from a man um, a lawyer, actually, who had served in the Rhodesian army in South Africa in the 1970s before the end of apartheid. He had been drafted against his will, handed a uniform and a rifle, and ordered to hunt down guerrilla fighters, who, by the way, he had, until that time, had been defending in court. Um, uh, and up until that time, he had very little experience using a rifle. And one day, he was deep in the forest, um, practicing with a, a small group of squad members in his, um, in his squad when he detected movement up ahead of him. And with a pounding heart, he saw a long line of guerrilla fighters dressed in camouflage and carrying machine guns. Instinctively, he raised his rifle, flipped off the safety catch and aimed at the leader who was carrying an AK-47. And then suddenly he felt a hand on his shoulder. Don't shoot whispered his buddy behind him. It's just a boy. He slowly lowered his rifle and looked again at the scene and was absolutely astonished by what he saw, which is a boy, about 10 years old, leading a long line of cows. And the AK-47 was actually a simple herding stick. For years afterwards, this man struggled to understand the unsettling episode that he had experienced. Was something wrong with his brain? Actually, 
no, it was working exactly as it should because your brain and his brain and every brain pretty much on this planet works by prediction. This is how your brain navigates the world, constructs your experiences and guides your actions. So it's a little bit easier to explain what I mean by this by using a less fraught example. So I'm not trivializing it. It's just a, a more straightforward example, I think. And that is um, baseball. So if you imagine that you have a batter facing a pitcher, a major league pitcher throws at about a speed of 90 to 95 miles an hour, which takes about 400 milliseconds for the ball to um, get to the pitcher's mitt after it leaves the, I'm mean, sorry, catcher's mitt after it gets to the, after it leaves the pitcher's hand. This is not enough time for the batter's brain to actually see the best fastball and react quickly enough to hit it. And here's why. It takes 100 milliseconds for the visual information um, that is it, enter the, the batter's eye to be processed by the brain so that he sees the ball. It takes 150 milliseconds for him to literally move the bat around to meet the ball. And it takes about 25 milliseconds for the batter's brain to send the signal down to his muscles for him to, to swing, which leaves 125 milliseconds to assess the pitch and decide whether or not to, to swing. And I just to, just to put this in perspective, it takes 300 to 400 milliseconds for you just to blink. And it takes the, about the same amount of time um, to, for you to press a computer key when your finger is already on the keyboard. In psychology experiments, anything less than 300 milliseconds and we count it, you know, a key press and we count it as error. So now I think we can understand a little bit what is happening to what would happen to our uh, Rhodesian friend all those years ago, why he saw um, heavily armed gorillas when in fact um, what was in front of him was a boy with cows. His brain basically was asking itself, based on what I know about this war and given that I am in a deep, deep in the woods with my comrades, that I'm gripping a rifle, um, that my heart is pounding, um, and that there are several moving figures ahead of me and maybe something pointy in one of their hands, what do I have to do to stay alive? And in this situation, as in all situations, his brain used his past experience to make a prediction about what to do next. And this prediction about what to do next um, then uh, made it more likely um, for him to see and hear and feel certain things. So with his heart pounding, um, the stuff inside his head and outside his head didn't match and the stuff inside was much more powerful and prevailed. Physically, he saw a gun where there was no gun and prepared to shoot an unarmed African civilian. Several years ago, I wrote an article about this in the New York Times. So what does this mean about policing? It means that if an officer's brain automatically predicts that the person in front of him is about to draw a weapon, that prediction is in effect preparing him to draw his weapon and take aim just like our Rhodesian friend. A prediction in your brain is on an abstract thing. It's your brain changing the firing of its own neurons to prepare you for action even before you see or hear or smell the next event. And in fact, that action of, of lifting a gun and taking aim actually contributes to you more being more likely to see a gun where there is no gun, just like the person in this true story. So for a police officer, the facts are that there are sim there's simply not enough time for a police officer to wait to see a gun and then only draw his gun. If he waits to see a gun and the other person actually has a gun, he's dead. And notice that we're not even talking about racism yet. We're not even talking about where predictions come from and, and how to change them and so on. We're just talking about the way the brain works. Everything you do and see and hear and smell and feel starts with what is in your head based on your past experience, which is then corrected by the world, maybe. 
And I say maybe because when metabolic demands are really high, like in a stressful situation and your heart is racing, then your brain, when it's predicting, um, you know, probably that your life might be on the line, um, your brain is pretty much going to go what's, what's, with what's inside your head and it's not really going to check the world. And in fact, there is evidence to suggest that when your heart rate's really high um, and you're um, under metabolic load, your brain just literally actually can't process uh, visual information in the world um, as efficiently um, uh, because actually the way that your brain samples visual information from the world is yoked to your heart and other um, internal signals. The second point that I want to make today is that there are really important individual differences in how this plays out in policing performance and the use, uh, the use and misuse of lethal force. Um, and we can see these individual differences in the field by looking at the physiology of police officers as they train using scenario-based training. And for this next bit, I'm going to thank Dr. Judith Anderson at the University of Toronto and her team um, uh, who um, generated uh, this, these data that I'm going to share with you. Um, this is Dr. Anderson, and she studies police officers during scenario training, which is the most ecologically valid way to study policing without actually following cops around on the street. And to demonstrate the importance of individual differences in nervous systems, I'm going to tell you a story about two police officers um, who were in one of Dr. Anderson's studies. I'm just going to call them Ernie and Bert. So Bert passed his written exams uh, in the police academy with flying colors, Ernie passed two, but you know, with somewhat lower scores. Ernie and Bert did some live action simulations to try out for the SWAT team. And here are the results, which tell a really dramatically different story. So the scenario here is looking for a victim in a burning building. Um, and what I'm showing you here is a graph. Well, I will show you a graph with minutes um, time uh, since entering the building, um, or, or actually since receiving the call. Um, on the x-axis, the horizontal axis, and heart rate on the y-axis, the vertical axis. So here is Bert's heart rate. And you can see that his heart rate's pretty high, actually. Um, here's Ernie's. Here is their heart rate when they are um, preparing for the call. And you can see right away that Bert's is higher. Here's where they enter the building by force. And when they begin to search for the victim, um, for victims um, in poor visibility, Bert's heart rate remains very high while Ernie's heart rate actually decreases. Bert becomes disoriented and Ernie actually has to rescue him and then go back in and find the victim and rescue that person too. And in live ammunition drills, which were um, later in the test, Bernie, uh, sorry, Bert made, um, many shooting errors. He was jumpy, he ducked all the time and, and hid more often, he, report feeling he reported feeling threatened frequently, and he shot almost everyone in the, at, in, during the drill. Now there's really much more to say about this, but given time, I'll just say the following things. First, evidence suggests that unchecked arousal like Bert's is related to pre um, predicting risk too often in, in the field, which uh, increased turns uh, to increase the likelihood of violence on the street. Second, some officers like, like Ernie can use their breath to control their peripheral physiology, their heart rate and so on, um, because they have experience in martial arts or in, in some kind of training that um, allows them to um, control their breath, which helps to control their peripheral physiology. And it allows them to perform better and to make fewer errors in using lethal force. And in this example, I just wanna say that both Ernie and Bert are white and they are, interacting with only white citizens in, in these scenarios. So you can just imagine what would happen um, when race enters the picture. Now you might imagine that it's possible to train officers to control their breathing and to use de-escalation tactics to reduce errors involving lethal force. And some evidence from Judith Anderson's lab suggests that, that this might be so, but the devil is actually in the details here. Um, according to Wikipedia, here are statistics for fatal shootings by certain countries for the last available year. And if you look by, by, by per, um, uh, one, uh, per 10 million residents, now look at the US, now look at Finland, 
where officers in training must compete, uh, must complete a three year university level program before they are licensed to carry a gun. I don't think I need to say more. I will just say that even though there are there is an increased effort in training police officers in the United States, for the most part, the training is often focused on how to shoot um, and, um, and considerably shorter uh, than three years. So the summary is, if we wanna build training programs to, to try and solve this pro pro problem, um, uh, then we have to really understand that brains predict, they don't react. Physiology varies and can be trained actually um, to keep your cool in stressful events um, so that you are less likely to perceive threat and less likely to harm people <clears throat> unnecessarily and training matters. To be serious about police reform in this country, we really have to address racial bias, but we cannot ignore the biology of the human nervous, nervous system, which express it, computes and expresses that bias. Every officer has a predicting brain and individual physiology and police training has to take both of these important factors into account. And that is my presentation. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, so now we are going to enter the question and answer and discussion phase. Um, so a reminder to all of our participants to please drop questions that you might have in the question and answer um, Zoom box, because that's where I'll be drawing questions from. And the first question um, is for you, Dr. Barrett, um, that predictions are based on something, sort of a core set of knowledge or prior biases, um, and what role does sort of the language of bias and the way that we talk about suspects and um, you alluded to training, sort of learning how to shoot, and what role uh, does all of that play in shaping how people then act on these neural predictions? Yeah. I have a lot to say about this. Um, the first thing I'll say is that, you know, you can't really cover all of that in a 13 minute presentation because what's really important to understand about humans is that we're social animals. And that means we regulate each other's nervous systems. And then we do it not just um, by interacting with each other, but by telling each other stories. And um, so where do predictions come from? Even before you enter the police academy, Predictions come from your own experience, but they come from reading the newspaper. They come from watching movies. They come from reading books. They come from the cultural milieu around you. A brain wires itself to its environment, to its world. And if your world is filled with, um, uh, you know, misinformation or a particular view of certain people who have certain characteristics, that's what, that is what your brain is going to use to predict. So there is a problem in police training, as I understand it, in that there's too much of a focus on how to shoot and not enough focus on how to de-escalate things and keep people safe. Um, that being said, I think that, the, that there's a broader issue here in that, um, you know, in just in the way that, that Judge Davis was discussing how the formation of police forces and how insular they are and what their, um, their the, the mode of training that they set up and so on, that people don't come into a police academy as a blank slate. They're a reflection of their culture. There are things that we can do to retrain people's predictions. It's just not going to happen in a, you know, two-week course or a nine-week course or, you know, something that has been trained for, you know, ingrained in you for years and years and years and years. The important thing to understand is all brains are biased. Everybody, you, if you can see and hear and smell something, it means that your brain already has used past experience in order to help you make sense of the sense data that you receive. So all of us have, are using prior experience. But what's the nature of that prior experience and how do we counter that prior experience if 
we um, we deem it important to do. That's really the task before us, I think. Um, thank you. Yes, a question is whether you can actually train for a different reaction. You sort of very tantalizingly mentioned um, that there might be the possibility of changing these predictions. Um, is there a way to formally train for an anti-structural racial bias in responses or sort of is there a way would the, the best alternative be to test for implicit bias initially and then? Well, let me just tell you, there's, a, I'll just have, again, I'll just say, testing for implicit bias, no test tests for implicit bias. Tests like the, um, uh, you know, implicit attitudes test, test for associations in your mind in a particular context. So it's a test of associations, it's not a test of bias. And let me just give you an example. Um, I mean, I can give you an example from a study that I read recently when I was on an NSF panel, National Science Foundation panel to adjudicate um, whether, in, whether the IAT and other tests like it actually test bias. And the finding was that, um, that physicians generally underprescribe pain medication to children of color, broadly speaking, and the, which is appalling. And, um, and the IAT predicted very, a little bit, but not really the behavior at all. And some people in the room wanted to say, well, that means there's no implicit bias. And my answer to that was no, there's obviously implicit bias. That's not what the IAT is measuring. It's measuring implicit attitudes, which may or may not be expressed, uh, you know, it, you know, in this, in the um, prescribing, there might be some other way in which you know implicit bias is making itself known because it's clearly there. And a similar study was recently run in Dr. Anderson's lab where she gave police officers this time in Canada, which is where she is, um, the IAT, and the IAT did not predict um, um, problematic the, the frequency of um, um, errors in the use of lethal force because everybody shot suspects of color more frequently, regardless of what their, um, regardless of, of what their IT score was. It was just really, really pervasive. So the answer to your question is, right now there are, I don't personally know of any training programs that are built using, with the explicit goal of changing these automatic predictions. Um, um, but the evidence in the literature suggests that it absolutely is possible to develop such training programs. And people's experience in their own everyday lives, I mean, uh, can, you know, you can change your predictions. It's hard. It takes a really long time to do. It's not something that's going to happen in a two weeks or four weeks or eight weeks. It is possible to do. It's just going to take a lot longer and cost a lot more money. And there has to be a willingness to, 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 to do it. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity actually to put really good neuroscience to practice, I think. Thank you. Um, another question that we have, this is for Judge Davis um, from the legal perspective and drawing on Dr. Saadi's presentation. If excited delirium is not a medical, a valid medical diagnosis or an accepted medical opinion, why is it still being used as a defense? Um, why, is, why is there any space in the system for it at all? It, it, it actually harkens back to what I described as the insular law enforcement community making up their own forensic sciences. And, and historically, judges and courts have allowed law enforcement agencies to get away with uh, junk science, junk diagnoses, made up anecdotal uh, descriptions of what happens on the street. And, and there's pushback against that. And, and part of what, I, again, I tried to describe was the introduction of scientific rigor in the, the adjudica adjudication of criminal cases has been a real positive movement. But yes, unfortunately the system has built in 
and I'd love to hear Dr. Saadi's take on this, uh, has built in a bias in favor of, you know, law enforcement experts and prosecution experts who come into court and are permitted to say things that simply have no scientific validity and conclusions that were arrived at in the absence of any scientific reliability. Now the law has changed again in the last 30 years. It continues to evolve, um, but it still happens. <clears throat> Dr. Sadi, do you want to address that? Yeah, you know, I, I when uh, my colleagues and I published our op-ed in the Washington Post, one of the most common sort of responses we got from fellow physicians was, what, I've never heard of this diagnosis. Like literally people just had never heard of it. I mean, this was um, uh, psychiatrists, internal medicine, neurology, um, and the emergency physicians um, that I spoke with all said, oh, it's just a diagnosis only applies in the um, legal context. So it sort of just doesn't exist. Um, and I think part of this also speaks to, and I think something that I am hoping to do in the work that I, is that we really do need to um, sort of break down these silos. And that's why the work of um, the CLBB is so important um, is we can't, um, we have to use our expertise and sort of bring it into these other spaces. Um, so I think that there's also sort of a history of maybe doctors sort of not um, venturing in these spaces or physicians not venturing into these spaces. And I think that that's beginning to break down. Um, the other comment I wanted to make, this goes to Dr. Barrett's um, uh, presentation, sort of comments about the prediction. I find it striking that um, sort of the focus and we're thinking about the police officer's mind predicting and I find myself thinking, well, what about the individual who's the victim in that situation? What is, What are the predictions that their mind are making? So that if there's a young black man who is having a police officer come towards them, that their mind is think, thinking that I might die. That I, that thinking about the fear that, you know, and sort of what is going through their brain. And yet somehow expecting that they should um, not, that they should, um, you know, not struggle in a restraint. Like to me, that's just astonishing. And I think to me, I was just thinking about how even that goes back to how excited delirium and sort of the fact that it's contingent on this, whether or not someone is struggling um, in the context of being faced with law enforcement um, is just um, really ridiculous. So I was just wanting to sort of, as we're thinking about police officers sort of reactions, also thinking about um, the other angle and sort of the, what that means. Yeah, so let me just respond to that if that's okay, Alyssa. Um, I think that you're raising a really important point. I do want to say that, um, you know, again, um, there's a lot to say about this. Let me, let me say a couple of things. First of all, um, I think that the actions that, um, the predictions um, that go through uh, a person's mind when they're faced with a police officer is really important. And understanding what actions they produce is important. And it's also important to understand that nobody um, reads another person's mental state ever. We always infer, brains are always inferring. So in just in the way that you mentioned um, that, you know, everyone resists restraint. It's a base rate thing that happens. Everybody does it. Um, and um, uh, how you interpret that, what that means, that action really depends on the context that you're in. That's how the brain forms predictions. So what someone would um, understand that, that, that behavior to mean in a medical context may be different than what they understand that action to mean in a policing context, just in the same way that you yourself, um, you know, when you feel a tug in your chest, you might interpret it as anxiety. You might understand it as you've eaten too much uh, at, me at a meal, or you might understand it as the beginnings of a heart attack. It's exactly the same feeling. It just means something different in different situations. So I think educating the police about what is a normative reaction and un having them understand that a facial expression, nobody, nobody reads um, anything in anybody's face or body they're just inferring, they're doing it automatically, but they're just inferring that this is important. 
And, but I also want to say that it's, this is such a complex thing that there's no way that you could actually discuss all of these things in 13 minutes. And if we were actually having a longer discussion, it would be important to think about actually not just what is the prediction in um, uh, a police officer's brain and, and what is the prediction um, in a civilian's brain, um, but um, our citizen's brain, but actually to think about the back and forth between the two um, in and to really look at what happens in an interaction um, where um, signals could be, let's say, better interpreted. There could be more empathy actually for both um, people involved that could, you know, prevent a death. And on that note, I'm very sad to have to say that the time for this panel has ended because I have many more questions to ask, but I want to thank all of our panelists so, so much for this excellent discussion um, and also extend a round of thanks to our friends and colleagues at Petrie Flom for being such wonderful partners and to the advisory board for the Center for Law, Brain and Behavior, whose leadership and support make events like this possible. Um, thank you so much and- Thank you all. <laughs>